About. What do these what do these things say? What are they blood types. Blood types. Yes. So it tells your fortune with blood type. So what's your blood type? A B. And what's your fortune? Fortune. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Congratulations. And what's your blood type? A. A. And what's that say about personality? Let me see, um, A. A. Uh, responsible, intelligent, and con co caution, but not easy to make decisions. Responsible, diligent, cautious, but can't make decisions. Okay, <laughs> bad luck. <laughs> Do you know the blood types of all your friends? Uh, sure. Oh, it, here in Japan, most of the girls are very, very interested in the blood types. Huh. So, so why is it so interesting, blood type? Oh, you know, maybe to know my boyfriend. Oh, to know your boyfriend? <laughs> I don't know why, but oh, my boyfriend is always blood type B. Does your blood type go together with B? Is it a good mix? I hope so. You hope so. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Whenever we choose a mate, however much we disguise the fact, we're making a biological decision based on quality. Youth, wealth and good looks are all important, but so is the fate of any children. At least the young Japanese think your destiny's in your blood. Not many people take that quite so literally, but what about your fate is in your genes? That belief has changed the lives of four very different families. They share a common and ancient fear, the fear of bad blood, the fear of genetic damage. What you know is not so frightening to you. What you don't have a knowledge of is immensely frightening, and therefore you steer clear of it. I know a couple of cases where people have don't want children because I don't want to bring a child in the world that's like them. So did it. Watashino No one's more obsessed with their bloodline than royalty. But the royal families of Spain, England and Russia share the most famous genetic accident in history. The idea of bad blood's been around for centuries. There's plenty of legends of families with a hereditary taint best not married into. Well, now the same idea is in lots of research labs too because genetics can tell each one of us whether or not we carry damaged genes, whether we might have a genetically damaged child. It's also beginning to tell us where genetic errors come from, what we should do to make sure we don't pass faulty genes to the next generation. It makes a lot of sense. After all, two out of every three of you will die for reasons connected with the genes you carry. And most childhood death in the Western world is due to genetic damage. And over there is the genetically best known city in the world. It's well known for a simple and blood-soaked reason. It's the city of Hiroshima, which 50 years ago was destroyed by an atom bomb. Atom bombs cause radiation. Radiation certainly kills people. Tens of thousands died of radiation sickness. But radiation also damages DNA. It causes mutations. And the fear of mutation has haunted Hiroshima and the rest of the world ever since. Yasukichi Okada was 12 years old when the bomb fell. あの当時私あの向こうに住んでいたんですけど、あの家にいた時に友達から電話がありまして、オデット、お前のとこにやるかやるからそこにオデット呼んで待っていたんですが、その時に待っていてドンとやられて一瞬恐怖しなっていた状
ボーンと大きな音がしてそれが彼が電話してこなかったらこの橋を渡って自然に乗って中心部に出て私はおそらく死んでいたと思うんですよ。私のところを寄るために電話してその彼は死んで私が助かったわけですよ。At just that moment, Chiiko Kuwabara was on her way to school. Hutoni,今思い出しても言葉に言い表せないほどもう死ぬんかなというような気持ちもありましたし、とても辛かったですね。でその橋まで来ますとね、あの。私と同じぐらいの学生さんが顔が膨れてそしてボロボロの洋服もボロボロにそして皮膚もボロボロになった人がこう横たわってたわけなんですその中に特に私の足をつかまえて助けを求めたあの生徒さんがいたんですけども本当に体はだるまのようにそして後ろを振り返った時に本当に悲しそうな目をしてその人の目がね今でもそのみゆき橋の顔の中を見ますとね下から目だけがこう浮き上がってくるような錯覚にとらわれます。週間ぐらい過ぎてからですが70年以上は草木も生えないだろうということが噂に立っていましたね。People began to fear that the survivors were contaminated too。22歳の時会社から慰安旅行に海水浴に行ってそして海から上がった途端に。会社の仲間はうわあ君が悪いと言って一瞬みんな立ち上がって逃げ出したそうしたら付き合っていた彼女が私の胸先を胸元を指さしてただ口には出さないんです何であるかを言わないで指を刺すだけで一瞬はっと思って自分の胸元を見るとその傷がボタンの花のようにこう膨れ上がってそれを見てそれが真っ赤になって膨れ上がってるもんだからみんなが逃げられて2日後彼女は付き合っていた彼女が私のところに来て今まで交際していたことはないことにしてくれこれからは交際しないでほしいと言ったその言葉で一瞬第二回目の被爆をしたような真っ暗闇な目の先が真っ暗になるそんな感じでしたね。The destruction continued long after the bombs had fallen. In 1945, nobody expected radiation sickness, but it killed thousands. Then there was a whole new threat of lasting damage to the genes, that the price of the bombing would be paid by children yet unborn. After the war, the Americans sent in a team of scientists, and they're still there. The enormity of the atom bomb experience was complicated by this mysterious business of what ionizing radiation would do to people. The survivors had a lot to worry about, but one of the major things they were concerned about was the possibility that the children would be monsters, that the radiation damage would express itself, in, particularly in the first generation, but maybe even afterward.
uh, in terms of major genetic damage. From the public's point of view, the fears about genetic damage were so great that there were questions about whether the atom bomb survivors should marry, should have children. There were screens to see whether somebody was an atom bomb survivor in terms of marriage customs. に参加お見合いはしましたけども本人同士は良くても、やはり後から被爆者だということが分かれば断られて、いつも断られてました。中戸さんが質問なさったのは、爆心地からどのくらいの距離で被爆しましたか、そしてその後あなたの体には何か影
Each year, on his birthday, his family gave him a pedigree pig. The family tried to keep his illness secret, but the news got out. The Spanish people were outraged. Queen Ina had brought a new dose of bad blood, the English curse of haemophilia, into the Spanish royal line. There's still argument about whether Alfonso was warned of the problem when he chose his bride. Certainly at the time of the engagement, when this photograph was taken, Ina's own family knew all about it. Two of her brothers, Leopold and Maurice, had the disease, as did her uncle and several of her cousins. What nobody knew is how haemophilia is inherited. Now it's a genetical classic. It's passed on through mothers who show no signs of the disease but affects only their sons. In fact, Ina herself had another son, Gonzalo, with haemophilia. The present king of Spain, Juan Carlos, descends from one of her unaffected sons and his family is free of the disease, as is the royal family of England. For Ina and Alfonso, though, Despite their public face, their marriage was over. <laughs> Alfonso blamed his wife. As he said, I cannot resign myself to the fact that my heir has contracted an infirmity which was carried by my wife's family and not mine. I know that I'm unjust, I recognize it, but I cannot think in any other way. The young Prince of Asturias, with his haemophilia, was forced to renounce the throne. Genetically damaged, he wasn't a suitable mate for any royal princess, and he married a commoner. To tell you the truth, I am just living very happily here, for it has not only enabled me to regain my health, but it has also brought me the chance of meeting my future wife. I place the affection of my fiancé above everything. And I hope that all the young hearts are with me. I hope that you girls will be as lucky as I am someday. This lucky Jewish couple in North London have something denied to the Spanish royals. They checked each other's genes before they ever met. In this marriage, I'm delighted to say, science led to romance. Etty Weinbaum and Abremel Brickman were brought together by genetics, with a little help from Etty's mother, Sandy Weinbaum. I have, um, I think it's considered a large family. I have 14 children. Um, my second child, who is a daughter, is getting married now. The rest are growing up and getting ready to get married. We don't encourage dating. So the girls are brought up in a pretty much girls-only environment, and the boys are brought up in a pretty much boys-only environment. So when it, they feel that they're ready to settle down, then it's up to us to start to make inquiries to find a match for a child. Parents usually begin with a matchmaker. That's an ancient custom, but Rabbi Lou brings it right up to date. Well, the matchmaker, or the shotgun as we call it, is somebody who is approached by the parents of the boy or the girl and facilitates an introduction where they meet, um, the backgrounds have been checked for compa compatibility, that there is nothing that untoward that one wants to eliminate. So what kinds of qualities are families looking for? Every person would want uh, certain qualities according to the priorities of the family and according to the needs of the individual child. Yeah. But God-fearing, good character, and good health would be important. And how important is good health for most families? For most families, it's very important. Obviously, for different people, it might be, if you want to quantify it, it might be 60%, it might be 80%, you know, something which they will not compromise on at all. 
one does know of families with some sort of genetic illness or the fear that there might be a genetic illness and that they might have to compromise in the partner or in the person they're going to meet. It's a compromise many are willing to make when facing a fatal genetic illness, Tay-Sachs disease. Rabbi Joseph Eckstein lost four children to it. Tay-Sachs is specifically very, very hard to cope with because the children are born normal. They seem, they're excellent, nice children, attractive children. You get very attached to them. And you don't even dream that there's some, some problems going on. They look excellent. By six months to the late, the late month, they're starting to miss another activity, another activity, and so on. And slowly, slowly, it's degenerating till the, the maximum four to five years uh, with a lot of suffering. A lot of suffering, the child dies. And here, that, that this is not only the, the, the child which is dying, everybody around gets very, very concerned. That was a, a real big problem for all my brothers and sisters to get married. So young people in this community face terrible problems, not just the tragedy of the disease itself, but the possibility of being rejected as a marriage partner. At this school in North London, they're testing teenagers to see who carries the Tay-Sachs gene. This card is your white card. Look after this very carefully because the number on this card is the only method we have to identify your result when you need it. Someone who has one copy of the gene is perfectly healthy. Only if their marriage partner is also a carrier is there a danger that a child will be born with a disease. But if I was to know that I had, um, was carrying the gene of cystic fibrosis or Tay-Sachs, I would be quite anxious, even though there's nothing to be nervous about. I would be afraid a little bit to know it. If I go to someone, to meet someone with a stereotype about myself, they have something wrong about myself, I won't be sure so much about myself. The only worry maybe that the test by mine was maybe done wrong and something <laughs> could have happened there. No, I'm sure the person would be very anxious. Would, and would, you, would you personally feel anxious? I definitely think I'd feel anxious. You oh, know, what, you've... what would you worry? I mean, you know, of course, that in fact, lots and lots of people carry these right. genes. It has no effects. What would you worry about? Um, well, worry isn't something that you really have to worry about something. You just, people just worry for the sake of worrying, and that's what would happen. It would cause a lot of unnecessary anxiety. There's no reason to make it more complicated than it is. But people worry, and people would worry about this also. People always say, let somebody else marry the carrier. And I have, n I have no doubt in this because this went on and on. Specifically, if there is somebody who is a carrier, he will be refused one after the other. And all the rabbis in our community believe very strongly that if we are going to start identifying carrier, this is going to make more damage than any good. A lot of people will be refused and not be able to marry at all. Rabbi Eckstein came up with an extraordinary scheme. Nobody's told if they test positive or negative. Their result is kept secret. We don't want your name on this. No names appear on this at any stage. We ask you to sign it using your assigned number, the number on the white card. When a match is suggested, the numbers of the two young people are compared. The parents are simply told a match is compatible or incompatible. When the particular young man that Etty's getting married to was suggested, um, it was done through a shadchan, an intermediary, and we gave Etty's number and Avramel's parents gave his number, and the inquiries were made originally then, before they even went out the first time. So they knew that from at least that point of view they were compatible. What then happened, which complicated matters, was that there is now a screening test for cystic fibrosis, 
which wasn't available when it was originally screened in school. At the last minute, the boys' parents decided that they would like that to be done. And I then had to go with Etty to have another blood test done and get that testing done. And she and Avramel had already made up their mind that they were right for each other. And I think those five days were the most fraught I've ever, ever had to handle with her in my life. And I wouldn't like to go through them again. And I, I saw then the wisdom of doing this before you start. Mm -hmm. okay. We'd already discussed what we were going to do if there would have been a lack of compatibility. Had it been at the beginning, there wouldn't have been any problem at all. She just wouldn't have met Avramel. At this stage, I think it would have created a very big confusion in their mind, but we wouldn't have let them go ahead. Beautiful. Okay, one like this. It's very, very good. Now, it's taken for granted that part of getting married is a natural progression to starting a family. So therefore, genetic screening later on would create numerous problems because abortion is not really an acceptable option in most cases. So it was a, a very big relief. When, when I got the compassable result, I was very happy, as he was even happier. Now, uh, Dr. Jones, you're the geneticist. Do you mind if I ask you a question? Huh? Um, this Tay-Sachs gene, which is so prevalent and uh, because of which we take so many precautions in our community, could you perhaps enlighten me as to exactly when it was discovered and uh, wh where it stems from? Well, we don't know for sure, but very recently, between the last few years, there's been a very interesting discovery, which is that the Tay-Sachs genes, mutations, and a genetic accident, is exactly the same in almost every person who carries it. And all the genes next to it are exactly the same as well. Which suggests, first of all, that particular mutation just happened once, because they're all identical. And there hasn't been enough time for the genes to get mixed together, like a hand of cards, as they pass from generation to generation. So it suggests very strongly indeed that the Tay-Sachs gene is actually rather new. Now, as you know, the ancestors of people with Tay-Sachs nearly all come from Poland. And then about 1650, there was a huge population explosion of Jewish people in Northern Europe. Their health was much better than the local population. Um, they had large families, many of their children survived. So that one copy, one single mutation, over a few generations went to be 10, 100, 1,000 copies of the same mutation. And that's now spread all over Europe, all over the world. So it was one unfortunate genetic accident at a time when the population was getting much, much more abundant. And now generations, hundreds of years later, are really having to pay the price. We can't test for all genetic disorders. There are far too many. But we all have to choose a partner somehow. And there's a clue about how to do it when we ask where mutations come from in the first place. Some genes show their effects in everyone who carries them. Anyone with even a single copy must cope with its effects. In my teenage years, they're my hardest years of my life because um, anybody I've got either boyfriends or girlfriends and no one's taken a bit of interest in me. It's because I was different. When you go through your adolescence and all the others are getting the cream of the girls and you think, oh, I'll go and chat that girl up and she says, go away. It, it is very, very hard and being rejected because nobody wants to go out with somebody who's down there who are a lot smaller than you. It wasn't till I plucked up the courage to go to the Restricted Growth Association. I heard about there was a Kabir convention at uh, Worthing and uh, so I just went along and hoping to find somebody. Once I walked through the hotel door, there's all these people like myself and that's where I met William. If you've got somebody at home in the same boat as you, you can go home and have a good cry and say to that person, oh, I'm fed up, you know, I'm getting rejected yeah. because I'm small and... Yeah, you get asked some daft questions, don't you, sometimes? I do, yeah. You know, I went to one interview once, and there's three people that were interviewing me, 
and they actually got asked how long have I been small. So I said sorry, and I thought I felt like turning round and saying to the guy, "Well, yesterday I was five foot two, and I woke up this morning and I'm only three foot ten. I really don't understand what's going on here. Could you tell me?" And I thought, "Well, no, I can't really say that because I'm not going to get the job." And I looked all three of them in the eye. I said, "Right, and let me tell you, I am." Denise and I've got a chondroplasia, which means I stop growing and I'm only three foot ten and a half. And if you would like me to ask any questions about my condition, please do. And they began to ask a few questions and I actually got the job. Oh, Mum, I didn't know you were coming. I can't give you a nice big surprise. Oh, good. Oh, I thought you were going to come it's going to be great having my, our own place because we're going to be part of the family, we're going to be a couple and also we're having a lot of adaptions made to the house. I've never been able to reach a tap without standing on anything and to me, having my, all, my kitchen made at my height is going to be like, I'm going to be in heaven. Yeah, there's the other one. I didn't know Graham had these, I can't remember I don't know, them. I perhaps they were wedding presents, actually, thinking about it. I don't think they could have been hers. Yeah. I think if they had been, I'd have had them by now. Yeah, I think they're wedding presents. Oh. To be able to have, you know, people around and family and visitors and also in a couple of years' time to be able to have our own family. Some people say that people like ourselves shouldn't have babies. So. A of rubbish. Why yeah. shouldn't we have children? We think we'll do a good job of bringing the children up. We do a hell of a lot better than a lot of other people do, who are normal. There is a risk that um, both Denise and I will pass on the gene. Uh, if both of us pass on the gene, then the child unfortunately won't live. There's a higher, more probable chance that one or the other of us will pass on the gene. And if that happens, then the child will have a chondroplasia. That's about a 50% chance. And then there's another chance that neither of us will pass on the gene and the child will be normal height. If I had the choice, if somebody said to me, right, you're having a baby and you can have a choice of what kind of baby you'd like, I'd like a baby with a condoplacer. Now, that might sound selfish, but that's what I want, a personal opinion. The reason for that is so I could bring that child up how I was brought up and I know that child, what problem it has, what... And it's like being like a little family, because we're all the same. But on the other hand, I will not reject a child, whatever it is. If it's, well, with any condition, I would not reject it. I'll just like a baby. Most people expect a child like themselves, as Denise and William are well aware. It's not as if we're going in blindfolded. Yeah. It's harder for my parents. It was a shock um, to have a, a contemplated baby. Obviously, it's a shock for new parents yes. expecting a perfectly healthy baby. They have the baby, it looks OK, then suddenly a couple of days or sometimes a couple of hours later the doctor comes up to say, your baby isn't perfect, it's only going to grow to four foot four. This is or... a bit of a shock. So where did the achondroplasia mutation come from? Where? My parents were told that it was just something that happened at the moment of conception. Well, one did wonder, you know, why? Now, how, why has it happened? What is the reason? Possibly, at the back of my mind, it might have thought, well, you know, have we a fault somewhere? Can I just rinse this one out? Yeah. And then we can put it... Every mother looks for faults in herself when she's had something wrong with her child. You, you think it's something you've done yourself. It's mother's instinct anyway, isn't it, it, to do that? Yes, yeah. Whoops! I nearly dropped it. I did wonder whether the achondroplasia was caused because I'd taken some tablets, antibiotics or something, while I was pregnant, which they assured me it wasn't. It was nothing to do with that. So then, obviously, I did start thinking back through the family. We can both go back in our families several generations, and there has been no knowledge of it at all in the family, or any of the families. It just happened. Denise and William's parents could find nothing in their families or the way they lived that might have caused the new mutation. So what have the Japanese discovered in the 50 years since the bomb?
Yasakichi Okada finally found a partner from whom he didn't need to hide his past. He married another survivor. Everyone in Hiroshima knew that women who were already pregnant at the time of the bombing had had severely damaged children. The great fear was that the sperm or the eggs of all the survivors had been damaged, so children conceived even years later would pay the price. Did the survivors think the risk was worth it? Yes, I did. I まあ、and now, is their daughter worried about effects in the future? はっきり言ってないですね。それに関しては、はい。あの、自分自身がその被爆二世ということで、あの、例えば心配することがあったりとかっていうんだったら、自分が子供を産む時は心配になると思うんですけど、はっきり言ってないんですよね。そういうのが
It's got one copy of it, the same gene, and uniquely one copy of something brand new, which is a mutation. Those parents, in their sperm or their eggs, um, there was a genetic accident. But the crucial point is, are these genetic mutations related to exposure to the bomb? Well, the answer is simple and oddly reassuring. Because if we divide these into two groups, those whose parents were not exposed at the top and those whose parents were exposed at the bottom, there is absolutely no real difference between them. Because there's two groups, four mutations in parents who were not exposed to the bomb and two mutations in parents who were. What these six genetic tests out of a million or so do very clearly is put to rest permanently the fears of the people of Hiroshima and perhaps of the other peoples of the world that atom bombs, that radiation might lead to permanent damage to the bloodline and produce in the future a race of genetically mutated monsters. この But now, at last, science is finding out where most mutations come from. It has nothing to do with atom bombs, with radiation, with pollution, or with malign and mysterious forces in the environment. The truth is more subtle and more disturbing. The answer can be read in the genetic records of families, comparing the genes of one generation with those that went before. The Prado Museum in Madrid holds one kind of genetic record. It's the family pedigree of Spanish royalty shown in portraits. Pictures of kings, of queens, of their children and their children's children. In some ways, it's a case of nature imitating art. Portraits pass on the image of one generation to the next. That's what life itself does, and roughly what genes do. They copy themselves over and over as cells divide. But life isn't perfect, and each time a copy is made, there are mistakes or mutations. As one copy follows the next, there are more and more chances for errors. Slowly, the genetic image gets blurred. And that's the beginning of the explanation of what makes most mutations happen. The first hint came from the parents of dwarves. They're much older than average. In fact, very old parents have a 30 times greater chance of having a dwarf child than very young ones. And it's not just age that does the damage, it's sex as well. Women make all their eggs when they're young and store them up until they're released. Men never rest. They make fresh sperm all the time, a new copy of the genetic instructions for each one. That's the real difference between men and women. And that gives us a simple sum. Any egg, however old the mother is, has been through only about 25 cell divisions. Any sperm has been through hundreds. In fact, a 60-year-old father is using sperm packed with DNA that's been copied a thousand times. For that reason alone, most mutations come from men. And now there's new and damning evidence from Hiroshima. The mutation hunters have looked at the DNA of survivors and their children. The result is absolutely clear. There aren't many mutations, but every single one of them comes from the father, not the mother.
What then of the haemophilia that blighted the life of Spain's English queen? Today, we can look at the gene directly and track down just where it turned up. The way it's done is to find a family with just one haemophiliac son and no history of the disease, that is, with a new mutation. That's exactly the situation here when haemophilia first appeared in the British royal family in Leopold, Queen Victoria's haemophiliac son. In almost every modern family that's been studied, the mother is, in fact, a carrier. But her parents are not. The new mutation must have happened in one of them. Every time, it can be traced to the father's sperm. This is the final proof that the man is the cause of the damage. What's more, the guilty grandfathers, like the fathers of dwarves, were older than average when they had their child. Now at last, we can work out exactly who brought new bad blood into the British and the Spanish royal family. The mutation must have happened in the august testicles of Queen Victoria's father, Edward, Duke of Kent. Victoria was born in May 1819. The basic facts of biology mean that she was conceived in August 1818. By a remarkable coincidence, her father was then exactly my own age, 51. He was an old man with old sperm. For some people, genetics has been a savior. It says that fear, rejection, and blame are often unfounded. But when it comes to choosing a husband, the answer is simple and depressing. Steer clear of old men. Above all, my advice is avoid someone like me. In the blood, we're back in two weeks' time.